Auto insurance can all seem the same until it comes time to use it. So don't get stuck paying more for less coverage. Switch to USA Auto Insurance and you could start saving money in no time. Get a quote today. Restrictions apply. USAA. This is Monday Matinee on the Mutual Audio Network. Come on, let's all go to the lobby. Because people are staring at us listening to these shows while we're in the theater. The following audio drama is rated G Wiz, which means it's perfectly safe for folks and families of all ages to enjoy with Cheese Wiz. Merry Christmas! <laughs> a Merry Christmas to everybody and a Happy New Year to the world! <laughs> Welcome to Reimagined Radio, a program exploring radio storytelling past, present, and future. I'm John Barber. This episode, a Radio Christmas Sampler, shares highlights from classic radio Christmas programs. We began with a sample from our 2020 Christmas broadcast featuring Metropolitan Performing Arts. Jeffrey Puka voiced the part of Ebenezer Scrooge. Our next sample is from the Vic and Sade series created and written by Paul Reimer and broadcast five days a week from 1932 to 1944. Episodes featured Reimer's unique comedic style and outrageous character names. In this sample from a December 1939 episode, Victor Gook, a bookkeeper for Plant 14 of the Consolidated Kitchenware Company, Sade, his homebody wife, and Rush, their adopted son, discuss why Vic has to send Christmas cards to people he rarely, if ever, meets. Enjoy listening to Vic's Christmas Card List. Every doggone year we go through this same old tiresome business. I don't send out Christmas cards for the sheer boyish pleasure of it. I send out Christmas cards because it's a thing I feel obligated to do. Let me look over them names once. Who's A.W. Grank? A.W. Grank happens to be chief accountant at Plat 9. Acquainted with him? I think I may truthfully say I'm acquainted with A.W. Grank. We've corresponded from time to time, and we've had long-distance telephone conversations on numerous occasions. You've never actually met him, though, huh? Not in the flesh, No. What call has he got to receive a Christmas card, then? A.W. Grank has remembered me with holiday greetings ever since 1930. Who's Greebly H. Snout? Greebly H. Snout is executive paymaster at Plant 12. Has he sent you cards every Christmas? He has. Who's T.O. Flies? Do you propose to challenge all the names on this list? I think somebody ought to draw the line somewhere. Every Christmas you go through the same identical performance. Buy bushels and bushels of cards and throw them to the four winds. We could buy a grand piano with the money we'd save if we used our heads about Christmas cards. You really propose to challenge every name on this list? I want to understand what's what. I try to cut down on expenses. You're going to mail elaborate 15 cent Christmas cards to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that draws the breath of life. I might as well know the worst. Say it every half wit year I have to tell you this. Mailing out holiday greetings is a business obligation. I don't take any childish ecstasy in wishing slobs like W.Y. Slatch a Happy New Year. W.Y. Slatch can go jump in the creek as far as I'm concerned. But if W.Y. Slatch don't find a delicate Tinsley remembrance on his desk for me around the 25th of December, he'd be sorry. On the other hand, a Christmas card for me will please him and give a rosier complexion to our business relations. Oh, who is W.Y. Slatch? Big shot in Consolidated Kitchenware's central New York office. Hmm. The first chair barber down at the Butler House Hotel claims he's lived his entire lifetime without receiving one single Christmas card. Hmm. He says it used to prey on his mind to make him cry in bed at nights, but in recent years he's taken pride in it. Mm-hmm. Now he's scared every Christmas he will get a card. He's worried about it. Wakes up in the middle of the night screaming. Who's that E.A. Droop you're writing down? Say, I absolutely refuse to sit here and account for every half that I put How do you I feel? Every time you think of some idiot's name, it costs us another 15 cents. 15 cents don't fall out of the sky. I try to keep track of my 15 cents. Goodness gracious sakes alive, if I shovel my 15 cents... All right, listen. Here's Milford Rapp, W.Z. Lippy, 
F. N. Jeweler in Wallerstown. They're all pals of mine from Plant 3, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. You have to send the whole slew Christmas cards? Certainly. And here's Kelly Gratch, Ian Blurk, H. D. Slice, and Axel Fungerman. They're all Sky Brothers of mine from the Sovereign Saturn chapter of Dubuque, Iowa. And here's Sam Daniels, I. H. Crank, and Orphal Gitch, sidekicks of mine from Dixon. Do they all have And A. Crop, Joe Gleek, O. Q. Fife, and Milton Eberly. Their friends are yours. U.A. Crop tied your shoe for you at the fairgrounds. O.Q. Fipe said your sandwiches were tasty at the picnic. Joe Glink gave Rush a dime. Milton Eberly got hit by a train. Y.B. Nush, Hummer Eggleston, Herman Spath, W.X. Kennedy, Norman Owler, Sid Freep, T.T. Wops, Ellery Snitch, A.L. Gazelle, Curtis Gouge, E.J. Plasters, N.F. Sapper, Fish Miller, Sam King, R.F. Sledge, Oscar Flubb, Jack Welpy. Mm. Sure. Peg? Yes? What's that name you're writing down? Wilmer I. Chish. Who's he? Exalted Big Dipper of the nonchalant Neptune chapter of the Sacred Stars of the Milky Way, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Well, why is he entitled to a 15-cent Christmas card? You heard Art Van Harvey as Vic, Bernadine Flynn as Sade, and Billy Idelson as Rush in that sample from Vic's Christmas card list. This next sample speaks to how, at Christmas, we reach out to others and perhaps chart a new course for our lives. It's from the March 13, 1949 episode of the Damon Runyon Theater, a year-long series featuring dramatizations of stories by the author Damon Runyon set against the backdrop of New York City. John Brown narrates as Broadway a small-time criminal with a heart of gold. His story has warmth and appeal. Let's listen to Dancing Dan's Christmas. So it is on Christmas Eve that I am in good time Charlie's. Charlie, yes? how does it happen you have no other customers tonight? Christmas Eve, everybody stays home. I figure I'll close up early and... Who's that? It does not make any difference. Let him not. Maybe it is someone who wants to see you. Oh, okay. Leave the door on its hinges. I'm coming. Hiya, Charlie. Dancing Dan. Yeah. Dancing Dan. Well, Broadway, how are you? Dan, is it safe for you to be out? Huh? Oh, you mean about Heine Schmitz. Oh. That is it. Well, this is kind of a farewell party, boys. From now on, I'm going this straight and narrow. You? Yeah, why? I mean, this is news. Yeah. Mm, maybe because I'm in love. This makes it worse. I presume the doll is Muriel O'Neill. Mm -hmm. You know, this is Christmas. I figure there's no better time for a guy to cut out his old life and build something new for himself. And that's what I'm going to do. Here's to you, Broadway. Look, Dan, you are plenty hot. Oh, sure, Heine doesn't like me. <laughs> and when Heine doesn't like somebody, that somebody is in the red. It's funny, isn't it? Here I am, in love with a doll who loves me. I want to go straight. I want to forget the old life and build up something new for Muriel and me. <laughs> I got to do it the hard way. Okay, tell you what. I'll stay just a couple of minutes. Then I'll take the heat off you two by getting out of here. Okay? Sure, Dan. You are an all right guy. Broadway, what do you say? Ah, it's Christmas Eve. What else can I say? Thanks. Well, Merry Christmas, boys. It is more than a little uncomfortable in good time Charlie's, as any minute we are expecting Shotgun Sam to poke in and end the proceedings. But all three of us are beginning to think that everything is all right when the scene is as follows. That is somebody at the door. Yeah, it is. Dan, there's a back way out of here. You think they won't have that covered? Open the door, Charlie. You crazy? I'm tired of running away. Open the door. You cannot do this, Dan. Step back. I'll open no, it. No, no, don't, Dan. Look, if anything happens, take that package to police headquarters. Police? Yeah, there's a note in it. They'll understand. Now get back out of line of the door. Merry Christmas. Gee, look. 
It's Santa Claus. It is somebody who looks like him. <laughs> hey, look. Look, it is Yuki. Yeah, Yuki dressed up like Santa Claus. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad you opened, Charlie. It's pretty cold outside. Yuki, what is the idea of the Santa Claus suit? Well, I'm advertising Fletcher's store. Fifty cents an hour I get for walking up and down the streets, handing out his cards. Oh, you got yourself a bad cold. Uh huh. Well, I need the dough. I ain't got a cent, and my wife's kind of sick. I I I'd kind of like to bring her a little present this year. Well, gotta get going. Here, buy the wife a good present, huh? Gee, well, thanks, Charlie. Here, give her one for me, too, huh? Oh, no, look. I'm making a real Christmas, Hookie. Well, gee, Dad. Guys, I... Well, uh, gotta get going. Wait, Hookie. You got dough now. Why kill yourself for a measly four bits an hour? Wait, uh, no, no. I need the job. So, you see, I gotta do it. No, you don't. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, I've been pretty sick the past year. Couldn't hold no job, but... This year's going to be different. I promise, Midge, my wife. Okay, take off that suit. Huh? But, Dan, I got... Take it off. Dan, what's the idea? I'm not going to let Okie walk around with that cold. Oh, now, please, Dan, I need the job I'm going to get. You'll get it, because Fletcher's Santa Claus is going to walk around. What are you talking about, Dan? Me. I'm going to be Santa Claus. Now I hear everything. But, Dan, Dan... Go on, start taking it off. And you stay here till you get good and warm. Then take a cab back home. Well, I'll have it off in the jiffy. Dan, you are crazy. You'll be walking around the streets. You'll be a setup for shotgun. You've got a chance if you keep out of sight. I'm going to make this the best Christmas I ever had. It says, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Okay, I'm through running away. If shotgun wants to rub me out on Christmas Eve, I'll let him. I'm not going to run away anymore. But what about Muriel? Why do you not think about her? I am. I'm giving her a Christmas present. Hmm? Huh? Yeah. Together, we don't have to keep running away. By herself, she'll do a lot better. Hurry up with that suit, Uki. Well, Vance and Dan puts on Uki's Santa Claus suit. Beard and all. We get a pillow from Good Time Charlie and make Dan look quite a bit like the real thing. And then... Just as he is about to leave, Dan. Yeah? I think I will walk a piece with you. Huh? <laughs> You're crazy. I, I need some air. Okay, I can't stop you. Oh, give me that package, Johnny. <laughs> what have you got in there, Dan? A uh, Christmas present for the police. Come on, Broadway. We step out into the street. The snow is sparkling under the lights, and the bells are ringing. It is a beautiful Christmas Eve, and everybody looks happy. Look, Dan, how far do you expect to walk? Not far, just to Muriel's place. Muriel's? Yeah. I want to put something in her grandma's stocking. I do not know what you are talking about. Oh, her grandmother hangs up her stocking every year and gets nothing. But this year, she's going to have a good Christmas. Just one before she dies. This year, that stocking is going to get something good in it. Like what? See this package? Know what's in it? I made a haul. 50,000 clams worth of jewelry. This is Christmas Eve, and so I figured I'd take it back to the police because I am going straight. Well, here's my last stop, Broadway. Look, then, forget this business. Oh, no, I still got Grandma O'Neill's stocking to fill. Come on. Stay back of me. Don't use you getting it, too. Well, here we are. See if the door is locked. Open. Uh-huh. Let me go in first. Be careful, Dan. Nobody here. Nobody but Grandma O'Neill. Look at her Broadway. Sleeping in her chair. And that stocking hanging up. Every year she does that. Well, now we're going to make it worth a while. Look at 
Stanley, yeah. Pretty sterling. You know there's a 5000 reward out for it? I... And you're putting it in your stocking? Well, why not? It's a nice Christmas present, ain't it? Here we go. It looks awful funny in that stocking. <laughs> and it's going to take more than a little explanation how it gets there. Uh, it's here. That's the main thing. Now, let's get going again. Where to now? Oh, I don't know. But you can go home if you want to. Yeah. I guess I will. Anyway, Van goes to the pen, but he gets a light sentence because he says he is going straight, and besides, he gives himself up. He gets out and marries Miss Muriel O'Neill, and the last I hear, they are living happily. But that is not the end of the story. Well, it is a year later that I am once again sitting in Mindy's. It is again Christmas Eve. I look up from my blinters, and whom do I see but Shotgun Sam? Hello, Broadway. Hello, Shotgun. It is just about a year since I saw you last, is it not? Almost exactly. Mm -hmm. I see you come out of Good Time Charlie's. You do? Uh Uh-huh. I'm looking for Dancing Dan. But I'm not looking for him anymore because Heine Schmitz no longer cares for Miss Muriel O'Neill. Oh. You say you see me last Christmas Eve coming out of Good Time Charlie's? Yeah. I get a tip that Dancing Dan is headed for there. I get there just as Ookie is going in. I wait, and then I see you come out with a piece. I must get a bad steer because Dancing Dan never goes in nor comes out. Well, I guess I will go now. Mm Mm-hmm. So long. So long. Oh, and, um, Merry Christmas, Shotgun. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. Not That's Metropolitan branches. Performing Arts from our 2020 Christmas broadcast. You're listening to Reimagined Radio. I'm John Barber. Decorating the Christmas tree is a holiday ritual. This can be pleasant or, in the home of Jack Benny, a shocking undertaking. Here is a sample from Decorating the Christmas Tree, the December 23, 1951 episode of The Jack Benny Show. Well, we're all through, Mary. Gee, it was nice of you to come over and help me trim the tree. Well, if I didn't, you'd never get it done. Say, Jack, shall I put the snow around the bottom now? Not yet. I want to see if the lights are working. I'll hold up the bulbs, and when I say ready, you plug it in. Okay. Ready? Ready. Pull it out! Pull it out! Pull it out! (laughs) My goodness. Oh, Jack, why did you make me shut it off? Those lights were so pretty, especially those two blue ones that kept flashing on and off. Those were my eyes. (laughs) I must have been holding on to a bare wire. Well, it's your own fault. Every time you fool around electricity, something goes wrong. It does not. I know plenty about electricity. Give me that tape. I'll fix this bare wire right now. Here you are. Thanks. When it comes to electricity, I know what I'm doing. See, when you see a bare wire, you just tape it up like this, and that way it's insulated against outside elements. There, that ought to be enough tape. All right, Mary, plug it in. Okay. Pull it out! Pull it out! Pull it out! For heaven's sake. <laughs> what happened, Jack? I taped my finger to the wire. <laughs> that's what happened. Oh, gee. And that time it is even prettier than before. What do you mean? Your nose lit up, too. <laughs> Jack, you better pick up those lights off off the floor before somebody steps on them. Oh, yes. Now, where can I put them? You know, I'll put these lights up here on the chair. Well, Jack, I guess that does it. Tree's all finished. Yeah. Gee, it looks swell. I'm kind of tired. I think I'll sit down for a minute and smoke a cigarette. Oh, say, boss. What is it, Rochester? Are your socks dry yet? My socks? I think so. Well, people will be here soon. You better take them off the tree. (laughs) No, that's right. You take them off, will you, Rochester? I'm tired. I want to sit here a while. Yes, sir. Hey, this tree looks all nice, but it's kind of dark. Oh, no wonder the lights aren't plugged in. Uh, I'll fix that. Pull it out! Pull it out! Pull it out! For heaven's sake. Well, what's the matter, Jack? I was sitting on the wire. <laughs> oh, uh, Come in! Hello! 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 Hello!
Hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Merry Christmas, everybody. Same to you, Phil. Hey, Jackson, that Christmas tree looks terrific. Yeah, it is a nice tree, isn't it? Not only that, it's grown about two feet since last year. <laughs> Phil, this isn't the same one. You know, Phil, I believe in the old-fashioned way of getting a tree. I know when you get up early in the morning and bundle yourself up warm, and you throw an axe over your shoulder and go out in the woods, you know, way out in the wilderness and... Chop down your own Christmas tree. Yeah, you're right, Jackson. Where'd you find this one? In the lobby of the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. <laughs> hey, Phil, what do you got in that package there? Oh, I forgot, Jackson. It's a Christmas present for you. For me? Yeah, me and the boys in the band all chipped in and got it for you. Well, thanks. Thanks. I'll put it under the tree. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Open it up right now. Okay. It was certainly nice of you and the boys to think of me. No, I really didn't. Oh, Phil, thanks. Gee, a beautiful turtleneck sweater. Gee. Well, look inside of it, Jackson. Inside? Oh! <laughs> oh, Phil! What is it, Jack? A turtle. Fine present. Well, fix him. Imagine bringing me a turtle for a thing, Gary. Come here, Phil. Phil, sit down on my chair. Well, thanks, Jackson. Are you, uh, are you comfortable, Phil? Sure. Good, good. Hey, Jackson, what about my present? Yes, sit where you are. You'll get it. You'll get it. It's a surprise. Harry, right, watch him jump. One, two, three. There. Hmm. <laughs> Phil? Phil, don't you feel anything? No, why? Phil, stand up a minute. Okay. Let's see. There must be something wrong with this thing. Uh... Pull it out! Pull it out! thing to do to a guy on Christmas Eve. Well, it's your own fault for trying to play a trick on Phil. Oh, so that's it, eh, Jackson? Trying to give me a hot seat. Oh, it was nothing, Phil. I was just trying to have a little fun. Pull it out! Pull it out! Jack, that's a doorbell. Oh, oh. Hey, who can that be? Come in! Well, I'll be darned. Hi, little fuck. Hello, everybody. Oh. Well, what a surprise. Andy Devine. Well, who'd you think I was? Frank Sinatra? <laughs> no, no, Andy. Your voice and figure are both a little huskier, I think. Hey, fellas, how about a toast? Hey, huh? I got one. Got go ahead, Andy. A toast? Go ahead. Here's to you, Buck, Mary, Phil, and the whole gang. We've been friends for a long time, and I hope it always stays that way. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, Andy! Merry Christmas! Jack. Can I give a toast, too? Sure, sure. Go right ahead, Mary. A Merry Christmas to everyone, everywhere. Yeah, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We won't go until we get some. We won't go until we get some. We won't go until we get some. So bring it right here. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. That's Metropolitan Performing Arts again. You're listening to Reimagined Radio and our Radio Christmas Sampler. I'm John Barber. I'll be right back after these messages. Community Radio Like This is brought to you by the generous support by our founding sponsors at ADCO Commercial Printing and Graphics. Clark County's local print shop since 1993, ADCO features stationery, posters, flyers, tickets, business cards, stickers, catalogs, and much more. Print on anything and mail anywhere. Learn more at adco1.com. That's A-D-C-O, the number one. Court-appointed special advocates for children, known as CASA, are volunteers who advocate for the best interest of children who have come into the care of the state as a result of abuse, neglect, or abandonment. You can lend your voice and volunteer with CASA to change a child's story. CASA offers virtual info sessions and training. If interested, now is the time to get involved with CASA and make a lasting difference in the lives of children and families in the foster care system. Clark County CASA is a program of the YWCA Clark County. 
More information available at casaclarkcounty.org. KXRW would like to thank Craft Cannabis, our exclusive cannabis sponsor for supporting our radio community. Their wide variety of products range from edibles, pre-rolls, concentrates, vapes, CBD topicals, tinctures, and much more. Craft Cannabis for 21 and over now has two locations in Vancouver. The newest shop is on Andreessen Road off Patton Parkway next to Home Depot. The Mill Plain location is in the Heights Shopping Center. Ordering options include online, in-person, curbside, and express window touchless pickup to better serve you. Hours and more information available at craftcannabis.com. Jolly old St. Nicholas, clean your ear this way. Don't you tell a single soul what I'm going to say. Christmas Eve is coming soon, now you dear old man. Whisper what you'll bring to me, tell me if you can. Welcome back to Reimagined Radio. I'm John Barber. Jolly old St. Nicholas, also known as Father Christmas, Kris Kringle, and Santa Claus, is a traditional holiday figure known for delivering presents on Christmas Day. But what if Santa Claus was involved in department store jewelry robberies? Our next sample is from the Rocky Fortune series starring Frank Sinatra, the singer and musical artist. Sinatra plays Rocky Fortune a footloose young gentleman who accepts odd jobs. Here he is as a part-time Santa Claus in a downtown department store. Santa is streetwise and hep-talking, but he's just the man to deal with the robberies and help out a young girl who wants a particular Christmas gift and her older, attractive sister. Let's listen now to Department Store Santa, the December 22, 1953 issue of Rocky Fortune. Did I ever tell you about the time I got mixed up in a plot to murder Santa Claus? Yeah. It all started when I answered a Christmas ad for a department store. The ad said, young man of good character is auxiliary store detective and other duties. Two-week employment. So, next day, I am an auxiliary shamus for Crack and Bomb's department store. Uh, this way, Mr. Uh... Fortune. Uh, Rocky Fortune, Mr. Prim. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, this is fifth floor, children's toys. This will be your post. What do I do? Just keep an eye on the merchandise. Quackenbaums has had a good deal of shoplifting recently. Yeah, especially in the jewelry department, eh? 8,000 bucks worth of pearls. Wow. The thief will be apprehended in good time, have no fear. Oh, and uh, one other thing. Yeah? At lunch hour, you will relieve Santa Claus. You mean put on a beard and everything? Oh, it's just for half an hour. Uh, just ask Big Elf to help stuff you. Big Elf? Santa's helper. The large fellow in the elf suit. Oh, sure. Good sure. luck, Mr. Fortune. The honor of Quackenbaums is in your hands. Big Elf, whose name is Marty, weighs about 250. He helps me with a Santa suit, and I take over inside the magic igloo while Santa goes out for some chowder. I embarrass a couple of mothers by promising everything the kids ask for, and I'm really living it up, having the time of my life when a little girl about six comes in all by herself. She's a pretty little thing, too, with blue eyes and freckles. On one leg is a light steel brace. Well, hello, honey. You here all alone? Yes, sir. Honey, what's your name? Gail. Gail Grayson. And what would you like Santa to bring you for Christmas, Gail? I'd like your elf, the one with the red silk suit and the green hat. Well, you leave your name and address with Santa, and I'll see if we can not arrange for something. Gail. Gail, oh, okay, there you are. I told you to wait outside the man's office. I wanted to talk to Santa about getting that elf doll. Honey, I told you that doll cost too much. Santa says maybe he can arrange something. Santa's wrong. Look, mister, I've just been seeing a man about trying to get a job in this place so we can afford to eat. I don't have money for expensive dolls. Well, I'm sorry, miss. I just... Well, you've no business building up false hopes in children. They put so much faith in this. Well, if you just let me explain... I'll... Come around and explain Christmas Eve if you can. Well, I'd like to, but I don't even know your name. This is my sister, Laura, and we live at 65 Bleakman Street. Five flights up, then a... Gail, for heaven's sake, come along. After lunch, the real make-believe Santa Claus comes back, and I turn over the suit, beard, and stuffing. I'm glad to get back to being a store detective. I keep thinking of little Gail. Well, let's face it, I keep thinking of her big sister. I wonder if I'm ever going to see her again. I don't have to wonder long because right away things begin to happen. Help! Don't be Tucker! Catch her! All right. Ho hold it. Hold it. Oh, let me go. Let Take me... it easy. Take it easy. Well, Laura Grayson. Who are you? 
Santa Claus, remember? My name is Rocky Fortune. I'm also the store dick in this department. Oh, Mr. Fortune, please. I, I don't know why. I, I took it. I... Well, let's see what we've got here. <laughs> it's the elf doll. The one Gail wanted. Oh, baby, if you're going to shoplift a doll, they got better ways worked out than just pick it up and run with it. I had to take it. I, I couldn't disappoint her. I, I couldn't. Yeah, I guess it was partly my fault. Well, I suppose you'll turn me over to the police now. Well, hold it, hold it. You're letting me go? Well, thank you, Rocky. Hey. What? You forgot the doll. But... I was going to buy it for her anyway. Now beat it. Oh, Rocky, I could kiss you. Go ahead. I will. Merry Christmas. And a happy new year to you. Wow. After closing time, I go into the employee's dressing room for a quick wash-up and a change of linen. Place empties out when my pal, the store Santa, flops in after a hard day at the igloo. He takes off his red suit, and I see he's built like a Japanese wrestler with a nose like Rudolph the reindeer, only it ain't from drinking melted snow. Looks as if the detectives and the Santa Clauses are the late workers in this department, huh? Yeah, just you and me now. That girl who stole the elf doll. What about her? I'd like to know her name. Look, I know you've been making a list and checking it twice, Uncle, but just what do you want to, why do you want to know? I, I had my eye on that elf doll myself for my kid. I'd like to get her for her. They got brand new ones in stock. I'm interested in that one. So the name, huh? Sorry, Uncle. Fortune. Maybe I don't make myself clear. I want that girl's name and address. I want it very bad. You know you shouldn't use that tone of voice. It don't sound like you got the holiday spirit. I'm going to use more than a tone of voice if you don't unclaim. Sorry, Sam. I managed to stagger out of my own power and head back to my flat. I figure I'll have some supper and then locate Laura Grayson for another look at that elf doll that everybody wants to get his hands on. Also, for another look at Laura Grayson. I stopped to line my flu at a local cafeteria and go up to the flat. I walk in like I live there, which I do, and discover I have guests. Hello, Rocky. Well, well, Sergeant Hamilton J. Finger. Rocky, there ain't no Santa Claus. How come? Because somebody stuck a knife in him. He's laying on his face over in Quack and Bomb's department store. Let's go. <laughs> I spend the next few hours as a guest of the city in the squad room or sweat box as it is affectionately remembered by inmates of various steel academies in this state. Let's have your story. Maybe it's got some connection with a jewel robbery. What do you know about the jewel robbery? Somebody snatched eight grand worth of pearls. You, maybe? Did it ever occur to you that maybe Santa Claus was in on that jewel job? As a matter of fact, Rocky, the guy in that Santa Claus suit has a record as long as your arm. So why pin it on me? You're available. Also, whoever stabbed them was in on the inside. It happened after the store closed. Also, there's eight grand worth of pearls floating around someplace and a reward for a thousand to whoever finds them. Finger turns me loose and I jockey my way right down to Laura Grayson's apartment in a cheap village flat. It's about 9 p.m. when I get my finger in the doorbell. Rocky. Hi. Can I come in a minute? Of course. Uh, listen, uh, honey, I I have to ask you something. Well? Have you got the, the doll? Of course. Gail's so happy about it, she's ready to fly. Uh, look, I, I, I'll have to ask you for it back. You what? Well, I'll, I'll get another one to replace it. A brand new one, really. But, but right now, I gotta have that one. Here. Thanks. Uh, I have to get back to the store. I'll call you tomorrow. Maybe for dinner, huh? Uh-huh. Good night, Laura. Good night, Rocky. I knew what she was thinking, so I didn't try to make any excuses. I just took the doll and headed back to my flat to take a look inside. It was as empty as an eggshell in a fox farm. I was just reaching for the phone when it rang. Hello. Rocky? Yeah. But this is Laura. Rocky, something terrible has happened. What's wrong? What's the matter? Well, just after you left, a man came, a big man with a black mustache, and he asked for the doll. Said he was from the department store police. I told him you'd taken it back to the store, and he left. Well, what's so terrible? Well, he must have awakened Gail, and she overheard us. Anyway, when I went into her room just now, she was gone. Rocky, I don't know what to do. She heard you say I was taking a doll to the store? Yes. Maybe she's on her way over there now to try to get the doll back. 
Look, I'll take a run over there just in case she shows up. You notify the police and meet me. I stuff the kids down in my overcoat pocket and flag a cab over to Quackenbaum's department store. In the darkness, it looks as eerie as a graveyard on Halloween. I figure maybe Gail managed to slip in past the watchman, so I give a yell. Gail! I'm going to scare myself to death. What's that? Nobody here but us toys, boss. Get him up, Fortune. I assume that ain't a lollipop stick in my spine. That's right, smart boy. So what do I owe the pleasure? I'm looking for a doll. You don't say. I do. So hand it over. There. Now stand still while I have a look inside. Okay, wise guy, where's the stuff? Stuff? Don't play dumb. With eight grand worth of pearls from last week's job inside this doll, where are they? Such me, pal. Maybe you got the wrong doll. I got the right doll, Buster. What makes you so sure? Santa Claus told me. Before he died. Looks like you and Santa Claus were in on that robbery. Yeah, that's what I thought. Until he tried to double-cross me. What happened? I heisted this stuff and gave it to Santa Claus to hide. He hid it so good I couldn't find it. He wasn't going to tell me where it was until I gave him more than half. Only I changed his mind for him. Yeah, with a four-inch blade. Uh-huh. I take it the stuff was in the doll. That's right, Rocky. Only it ain't there now. And you had that doll. Which means? Unless you unclam, I may have to give you the same treatment I gave Santa Claus. I'm telling you, the pearls were gone when I got that doll home. And I'm telling you, if they were gone, it's because you took them. I don't have them. Sue me. Rocky, old man, it's Christmas time and goodwill to men and all that. But if you don't spill them pearls in five seconds, I'm going to put lead in your braid. Now, where are they? I don't know. One, two, three, four. Rocky. What the... Gail, hi, honey. I'm back here, Fortune. Here's a football for Christmas, boy. <gasps> I let Big Elf have it in a puss with a football from the toy counter and grab the kid. We duck into the maze of counters and crawl along until we get behind some packing crates. Marty's cursing and looking for us. And he's still got a gun, too. Fortune! It's no use, Fortune. I'm going to find you, and when I do... Shh! Rocky, I'm scared. So am I, kid. We got to do something. Let's see what they got in these boxes. Mighty Mike Mechanical Police Car. Hey! Let me have one of those. Here. What are you going to do, Rocky? You'll see. I'm coming, Fortune. Look out, Marty. What's that? That's two shots. He's got a revolver that holds six, four to go. Let's see now. Here's something, Rocky. Super rocket ship. Fine. Let's try this on. Ready? Go. Fortune, are you crazy? I'm going to get you. Three and two or five. One more. What's in that box? It's an atomic blaster, junior space cadet size. Why not? Let's try it. I hear you, Fortune. I hear you now. Try this, Colonel. You missed, Marty. That's pretty bad shooting. Maybe, punk, but this ain't gonna be. Mother. Those things gotta be loaded before you can shoot them, Marty, remember? You dirty... Here's something else for Christmas. Oh! Gift to Santa's helper was a Louisville slugger right on top of the noggin. And just as he went out, the lights went on. And suddenly the place is crawling with humanity. Rocky, Gail, are you all right? We're fine, baby. Well, look who's here, late as usual. No wisecracks. Is this the missing kid lady? Yes, officer, thank you. Who's the stiff? This is the bum who killed Santa Claus. Boy, you should have seen Rocky beat him with that bat. By the way, Gail, where's the stuff that was inside the doll? You mean the pretty marbles? I thought they came inside the doll, Rocky. It was a sort of surprise. Some surprise. Do you have them? I think so. In my pocket someplace. Oh, here they are. Sergeant? Uh, here you are, sir. Just in case you ain't got all your marbles. Marbles? Hey, those are the pearls that were heisted last week. Gail, I'm sorry about the doll, honey, but unless I'm mistaken, you got about a thousand dollar reward coming for this stuff. A thousand dollars? Rocky, it's too good to be true. I must be dreaming. Want me to pinch you? Couldn't you just kiss me instead? Why not? Mm. Merry Christmas. 
Happy New Year. Yeah. beautiful rendition of Angels We Have Heard on High by Metropolitan Performing Arts. You're listening to Reimagined Radio and our radio Christmas sampler. I'm John Barber. Time now for another short break. I'll be right back after these messages. Programming like this is brought to you through the generous support of our founding sponsors at ADCO, Commercial Printing and Graphics, Clark County's local print shop since 1993. ADCO features stationery, posters, flyers, tickets, business cards, stickers, catalogs, and much more. Print on anything and mail anywhere. Learn more at adco1.com. That's adco1.com. Court-appointed special advocates for children, known as CASA, are volunteers who advocate for the best interest of children who have come into the care of the state as a result of abuse, neglect, or abandonment. You can lend your voice and volunteer with CASA to change a child's story. CASA offers virtual information sessions and training. If interested, now is the time to get involved with CASA and make a lasting difference in the lives of children and families in the foster care system. Clark County CASA is a program of the YWCA Clark County. More information available at casaclarkcounty.org. KXRW would like to thank Craft Cannabis for supporting our radio community. Craft Cannabis, for 21 years and over, now has two locations in Vancouver. The newest shop is on Andreessen Road off Padden Parkway, next to Home Depot. At this location, they offer Top Shelf Tuesday, Waxy Wednesday, and Stony Sunday specials. The Mill Plain location is in the Height Shopping Center with Munchy Monday and Saturday specials. Ordering options include online, in-person, curbside, and express window touchless pickup to better serve you. Hours and more information available at craftcannabis.com. Welcome back to Reimagined Radio. I'm John Barber. We're sampling Christmas motifs from classic radio programs. Next, let's consider, from a paranormal perspective, being away from family and friends at Christmas. Here is the December 20th, 1959 episode of Suspense, titled Korean Christmas Carol with Bill Lipton. Sounds good, doesn't it? The name's Connolly, PFC Larry Connolly. I'm a soldier in Korea. And that's where this strange story begins. Christmas. 1958. Christmas was for me that year miserable. I've been stuck on guard the night before, and so I planned to stay in bed the next day and forget about Christmas. I hadn't counted on my first sergeant. Since I was the first man he came to in the barracks, it's only logical that I should be the man he picks to drive a truck all the way to Seoul and back. It was night by the time I got on the road headed back from Seoul. It started to snow. Big flakes coming down soft at first, then so thick and fast I could hardly see. I was just over that first range of mountains. I was starting on the twisting, slippery way down when I saw him. The sight of him scared me wide awake. He was standing bareheaded, the wind whipping the snow and his hair around his face. You want a lift? I'm going as far as Camp Santa Barbara. Well, where's that? What do you mean, where's that? Everybody knows where Camp Santa Barbara is. All right. <coughs> My name's Connolly. Larry Connolly, what's yours? Oh, thanks. Mine's Richard Dombrowski. Good to know you, Dombrowski. Uh -huh. Say, look, if you can let go of that bag long enough, I'll let you wear my gloves till your hands warm up. Oh, no, thanks. That's all right. I'll put them in my pockets. Say, is it okay if I set my bag on the floor? Oh, sure, no sweat. Mm -hmm. Say, you don't have a cigarette, do you? I'm fresh out. Well, I don't know. I... Wait a minute. 
Yeah, here's some. Uh, let me light it for you, though. You watch the road. I saw a whole truckload of troops disappear over that curve up ahead. Killed all but two. Yeah? When uh, that happened? 1951. 1951? Yep. You were here when the war was on. I guess you could say that. Tell me, Dombrowski, what were you doing Christmas Day? Bet they didn't send you all the way to Seoul with an empty truck on a wild goose chase. <laughs> That's what I did today. What did you do seven years ago? Well, you see those lights up ahead? That's the village of Chungju Ri. We marched through there the day before Christmas. Were you scared? Oh, I think everybody's scared. Hey, hey, look out. You'll burn yourself. What's the matter? Cigarette burned all the way down to your fingers. Oh. Isn't it burning you? Well, that? No, no. I, I guess it burned itself out before it got to my skin. Anyway, you see that hill over there? Well, Christmas Day, 1951, my platoon was all dug in around that hill. No kidding. Mm-hmm. We went out on a patrol from that hill. And that was one time I was plenty scared. As a matter of fact, it happened just seven years ago tonight. It hadn't snowed that day, but there was snow on the ground. I can remember because the guys were joking that at least we had a white Christmas. And what a Christmas it was. It was quiet. Christmas Day, 1951. We were sitting around in our holes waiting for the fun which we knew would begin the next day. They'd managed to get hot turkey up to us, so we were relatively comfortable and happy until Brownie, our squad leader, came back from a talk with the old man. All right, I'll take the first five. The old man wants us to go out and have a look around. Oh, come, on, come, come on, come on, on knock it off. Get rid of your dog tags and canteens, anything that might rattle or make a noise. We won't be gone long, but we're moving light. We moved out on schedule just as night was falling. And with the night came the cold. We moved rapidly along the valley for about an hour or so when Brownie stopped and raised his hand. All right, you men, hold it up. Once we get on the other side of that ridge up ahead, we'll observe maximum security. No talking, no lights. Keep down and watch where you put your big clumsy feet. Yeah. These people just love trip wires with flares attached. Okay, everybody set? Let's move out. And so we did move out. The M1 felt light in my hands, like I'd never realized how light and easy it was to carry a rifle before. The going was easy. The rice paddies were frozen over and covered with snow, and we stepped carefully between the clumps of rice stubble left over from the last harvest so the dry straw made no noise. We walked steadily, quietly, maybe 200 yards without a sound, regularly stepping up and over each low rice paddy wall as we came to it, each one bringing us just that much closer to the top. And then it happened. Hit! Down! Hit the dirt! Get down! Somebody must have tripped a wire because suddenly the inky black was transformed into the merciless white of the operating table. Everything seemed stopped and slowed down, just like an old movie before the projector blows up. I could see the other guys, the hills, and the deadly winking fires of the guns. And then we fell down to the protection of the earth. And some of us fell with metal in our bodies. Crawl, crawl, you apes. Crawl to the mud tight and stay low. They can't hit us there. And we crawled digging our knees and fingers into the frozen mud until they were bruised and torn. We crawled closer to the ground and faster than we ever had before. We crawled to the sanctuary of a foot-high mud hill. Keep your heads down. They got a sprint. It was about 150 yards to our front. Where's the other? The other's 200 yards to the left. They got a sprint in a crossfire. We'll never get out of here. All right, all right. Now, don't panic. Keep your head down. We'll make it out. Walker? We'll move along the dike to the edge of the rice paddy. From there, we can duck into the underbrush and move back down the mountain. We'll never make it. They'll spot us when we try to make it across the clearing to the underbrush. They'll swing their guns around. We gotta try it. We can't stay here. Stevens, can you crawl? Yeah, I can make it. Okay, now you lead off and I'll follow you. I'll crawl backwards and pull Whitey along behind me. Whitey? You heard me. Well, we'll never make it with Quiet! It. All you have to do, Harry, is follow along behind and pick up the pieces. Take his weapon. It'll make him lighter. Keep your hands off me, Harry. Come on, Whitey. We haven't any time to fool around. I'm not fooling. 
I'm not going with you guys. Come on, you lost too much blood already. That's just it. Like you said, Brownie, it's only a matter of time. You can't get anywhere with me. You'll never even get past the clearing trying to drag me across. You're smart enough to know that, Brownie. It'll be tough enough, even with two good legs. We're not leaving you here. That's what I figured you'd say, Brown. I'm still in charge here. I figured you'd say that, too. Brownie, you see this grenade? It doesn't have any pin in it. The only thing that keeps the spring from kicking the clip off is my hand. Now get out of here, Brownie, before I let it go. Oh, why do you like... You want me to let loose of this grenade? Now prop that VAR up on the dike in front of me. And scatter the clips where I can get at them. I'll wait until you guys get to the edge of the paddy before I open up. Look, look, baby. I'm still holding the grenade, Brownie. Time is running out. You're going to have to hurry. I feel like I want to fall asleep, and I don't know how much longer I can stay awake. Just wish me a, a very Merry Christmas and beat it. Merry Christmas, Whitey. All right, you guys, what are you waiting for? Let's move out. See, that's right. This is Christmas. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see. What's the matter? Don't you people like Christmas carols? Above thy dark and dreaming. Whitey lay there until the others had crawled to the end of a low rice paddy wall. And then he threw his grenade. When it exploded, he opened up with a BAR, making enough noise to make the enemy think the patrol was launching an attack. Both machine gun nests zeroed in on him, but Whitey stayed well below the little mud wall of the rice paddy, humming his Christmas carol, loading the BAR with a fresh clip every time it went empty, and perhaps wondering briefly why he was going to die so far away from home. A little pond of frozen mud he didn't care about or even own still firing and singing, even after the rest of the squad had escaped into the underbrush and until either the machine gunners found their mark or else he finally fell asleep. Oh, gosh. He was quite a guy. No, I... guess it was just a detail that had to be done and he had to do it. Well, there's my stop right there where that little road turns off up ahead. Your detachment's up that road? That's right, right at the end of it. You're sure I've seen that road before, but I didn't think there was anything up there. <laughs> well, just let me out here. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks a lot. No sweat. <laughs> Say, uh, if you ever want to look me up, remember my outfit's all the way up at the end of this road. I'll be right up there. Okay, I'll drop in sometime. Right. So long. And thanks again. I drove off figuring it would be a very cold day in Korea before I ever looked him up. Such a weird guy gave me the creeps. I got about five miles down the road when I discovered he left his bag sitting on the floor of the deuce and a half. Took a lot of arguing with myself, but uh, I decided that the only decent thing I could do was to swing around and take it back to him. Besides, maybe I could stop in the orderly room and check him out find out what his story really was. On the way back, I almost missed the road because it was so small and seldom used. I drove up it for about 10 minutes. I was beginning to wonder if I hadn't gotten the wrong road after all. Just when I was ready to turn back to the main road, I saw lights twinkling up ahead from what looked like a couple of Quonsets. It seemed impossible that an infantry outfit could be housed in two Quonsets, but I pulled the deuce and a half to a hole outside the gate and cut off the motor. I picked up the AWOL bag, got out of the truck. I walked across the hard-packed snow of the yard to the first Quonset. I still couldn't figure it out. Light and warmth seemed to pour from the windows along with the music I remembered from somewhere, but couldn't quite understand. I stepped up to the first window I came to and looked inside. There were kids all over the place, kids of all sizes and descriptions, kids just old enough to sit by themselves. Kids just losing their first teeth. Some just starting their teens. I stood in the snow spellbound, just watching them sing. Finally, I tore myself away and headed for the front door, eager to be inside. 
A plaque made out of the howitzer shell stopped me. In the faint light, I could just barely make out the words engraved on the polished brass. It said, This orphanage has been erected and maintained in the memory of Corporal Richard Whitey Dombrowski, who somewhere north of the village of Chengju Ri, Christmas night, 1951, willingly gave his life that others might live. Suddenly, I didn't know where I belonged anymore. The AWOL bag dragged at the end of my arm like a thousand pound weight. I could figure what was in it, but I tore it open anyway. The bag full of candy, soap, and toothpaste and gum shined up at me, looking as rich and rare as frankincense and myrrh. I closed the bag, laid it up against the door, close, so they wouldn't miss it. And then I banged on the door as loud and long as I could, until I was sure that they heard me. And then I ran. I ran back down the road to my truck as fast and as hard as I could. What fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. What fun to ride and sing in a one-horse open sleigh. Dashing through the snow. This concludes our Radio Christmas Sampler, an episode of Reimagined Radio. You heard samples from A Radio Christmas Carol by Metropolitan Performing Arts, 2020. Vic's Christmas Card List from Vic and Sade, 1939. Decorating the Christmas Tree from the Jack Benny Program, 1951, Department Store Santa from Rocky Fortune, 1953, A Korean Christmas Carol from Suspense, 1959, and Bing Crosby and the Kraft Music Hall, December 12, 1944. Our script was written by John Barber. Sound design and post-production by Mark Rose of Fuse Audio Design. Social media by Regina Carroll Social Media Management, Graphics by Holly Slocum Design. This is a production of Reimagined Radio. Our radio broadcasts are heard on local, regional, and international community radio stations. For streaming, point your browsers to reimaginedradio.net. That's reimaginedradio, all one word, no punctuation, dot net. While there, you can learn about our upcoming episodes and subscribe to our free snappy program guide. This is John Barber, producer and host. Thank you so much for listening, and please join us again for another episode of Reimagined Radio, where we will continue our exploration of radio storytelling. Happy holidays, everyone. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Thank you for listening to Monday Matinee right here on the Mutual Audio Network. Please consider subscribing to other days of the Mutual feeds, including Tuesday Terrors for Horror, Wednesday Wonders, our science fiction and fantasy magazine, Thursday Thrillers for Action, Adventure, Mystery, and Crime Drama, Friday Follies, our end-of-the-week comedy series, Saturday Story Circle for kids and families alike, and Sunday Showcase, bringing you the very newest in audio releases for the week, from our United Artists of Audio, right here on the Mutual Audio Network. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.